All right, we left off right in the middle of a kind of an exciting section. Um, I should suggest that dreamwalking might be the most efficient remedy. You can dreamwalk, can you not? I'm not sure, said Bod. Mr. Pennyworth showed me how, but I haven't really... Well, there's things I really only know about in theory. And Pertunia Pearson said, Dreamwalking is all very well, but I might suggest a good visitation. That's the only language that these people understand. Oh, said Amabella, a visitation. Portunia, my dear, I don't really think so. No, you don't. Luckily, one of us thinks. I have to be getting home, said Bod hastily. They'll be worrying about me. Of course, said the Pearson family, and lovely to meet you, and a very good evening to you, young man. Amabella Pearson and Portunia Pearson glared at each other. Roderick Pearson said... If you'll forgive me asking, but your guardian, he is well? Silas? Yes, he's fine. Give him our regards. I'm afraid a small church yard like this, well, we're never going to meet an actual member of the honor guard. Still, it's good to know that they're there. Good night, said Bod, who had no idea what the man was talking about, but filed it away for later. I'll tell him. He picked up his bag of school books, and he walked home, taking comfort in the shadows. Interesting. That's the first time we've heard that mentioned. And it's capitalized, the honor guard. And the fact that the author pointed out that Bod was kind of, like, no idea what the man was talking about, drew my attention to it. That maybe it's something that we should be paying close attention to. Going to school with the living did not excuse Bod from his lessons with the dead. The nights were long, and sometimes Bod would apologize and crawl into bed exhausted before midnight. Mostly, he just kept going. Mr. Pennyworth had little to complain of these days. Bod studied hard and asked questions. Tonight, Bod asked about hauntings, getting more and more specific, which exasperated Mr. Pennyworth, who had never gone in for that sort of thing himself. How exactly do I make a cold spot in the air? he asked. And I think I've got fear down, but how do I take it all the way up to terror? And Mr. Pennyworth sighed and harumphed and did his best to explain, and it was gone four in the morning before they were done. Bod was tired at school the next day. The first class was history, a subject Bod mostly enjoyed, although he often had to resist the urge to say that it hadn't really happened like that, not according to the people who had been there anyway. But this morning... He was, Bod was fighting to stay awake. He was doing all he could do to concentrate on the lesson, so he was not paying attention to much else going on around him. He was thinking about King Charles I, about his parents and Mr. and Mrs. Owens, and of the other family, the one he could not remember. When there was a knock at the door, the class and Mr. Kirby all looked to see who it was. It was year seven who had been sent to borrow a textbook. And as they turned, Bod felt something stab into the back of his hand. He did not cry out, he just looked up. McFarthing grinned at him, grinning down and grinned down at him, a sharpened pencil in his fist. I'm not afraid of you, whispered Nick Farthing. Bod looked at the back of his hand, a small drop of blood welled up there in the point of the pencil where the point of the pencil had punctured it. Mo Quilling passed Bod in the corridor that afternoon, her eyes so wide he could see the whites all around them. "'You're weird,' she said. "'You don't have any friends.' "'I didn't come here for friends,' said Bod truthfully. "'I came here to learn.' Mo's nose twitched. "'Do you know how weird that is?' she asked. "'Nobody comes to school to learn. I mean, you, become, you come because you have to.' Bod shrugged. "'I'm not afraid of you.' she said. Whatever trick you did yesterday, you didn't scare me. Okay, said Bod, and he walked down the corridor. He wondered if he had made a mistake getting involved. He had made a misstep in judgment, that was for certain. Mo and Nick had begun to talk about him. Probably the year sevens had as well. Other kids were looking at him, pointing him out to each other. He was becoming a presence rather than an absence, and that made him uncomfortable. Silas had warned him to keep a low profile, told him to go through school partly faded, but everything was changing. He talked to his guardian that evening, told him the whole story. He was not expecting Silas's reaction. 
I cannot believe, said Silas, that you could have been so, so stupid. Everything I told you about remaining just this side of invisibility, and now you've become the talk of the school? Well, what did you want me to do? Not this, said Silas. It's not like the olden times. They can keep track of you, Bod. They can find you. Silas's unmoving exterior was like the hard crust of rock over molten lava. Bod knew how angry Silas was only because he knew Silas. He seemed to be fighting his anger, controlling it. Bod swallowed. What should I do? He said simply. Don't go back, said Silas. The school business was an experiment. Let us simply acknowledge that it was not a successful one. Bod said nothing. Then he said, It's not just the learning stuff. It's the other stuff. Do you know how nice it is to be in a room filled with people and for all of them to be breathing? It's not something in which I have ever taken pleasure, said Silas. So you do not go back to school tomorrow. I'm not running away, not from Mo or Nick or school. I'd leave here first. You will do as you are told, boy, said Silas, a knot of velvet anger in the darkness. Or what, said Bod, his cheeks burning. What would you do to keep me here? Kill me? And he turned on his heel and he began to walk down the path that led to the gates and out of the graveyard. Silas began to call the boy back. Then he stopped and stood there in the night alone. At the best of times, his face was unreadable. Now his face was a book written in a language long forgotten in an alphabet unimagined. Silas wrapped the shadows around him like a blanket and stared after the way the boy had gone and did not move to follow. Wow, that's a great paragraph with some really good figurative language. I caught a really cool simile and then a cool metaphor. No, other way around. A cool metaphor and then a cool simile. His face was a book written in a language long forgotten in an alphabet unimagined. Great metaphor. And then simile. Silas wrapped the blankets around him. (laughs) Silas wrapped the shadows around him like a blanket. Some cool figurative language. Nick Farthing was in his bed, asleep and dreaming of pirates on the sunny blue sea, when it all went wrong. One moment he was the captain of his own pirate ship, a happy place crewed by obedient eleven-year-olds, except for the girls who were all a year or two older than Nick and who looked especially pretty in their pirate costumes. And the next he was alone on the deck in a huge dark ship the size of an oil tanker with ragged black sails and a skull for a figurehead was crashing through the storm towards him. And then, in the way of dreams, he was standing on the black deck of the new ship, and someone was looking down at him. "'You're not afraid of me,' said the man standing over him. Nick looked up. He was scared. In his dream, scared of the dead-faced man in pirate costume, his hand on the hilt of a cutlass. "'Do you think you're a pirate, Nick?' asked his captor, and suddenly something about him seemed familiar to Nick." You're that kid, he said, Bob Owens. I, said his captor, am nobody, and you need to change, turn over a new leaf, reform, all that, or things will get very bad for you. Uh, Bad how? Bad in your head, said the pirate king, who was now only the boy from his class, and they were in the school hall, not the deck of the pirate ship, although the storm had not abated and the floor of the hall pitched and rolled like a ship at sea. This is a dream, Nick said. Of course it's a dream, said the other boy. I would have to be some kind of monster to do this in real life. Uh, What can you do to me in a dream, asked Nick. He smiled. I'm not afraid of you. You've still got my pencil in the back of your hand. He pointed to the back of Bod's hand, at the black mark the graphite point had made. "'I was hoping it wouldn't have to be like this,' said the other boy. He tipped his head on one side as if he was listening to something. "'They're hungry,' he said. "'What are?' asked Nick. "'The things in the cellar, or 
below decks. Depends whether this is a ship or a school, doesn't it? Nick felt himself beginning to panic. It, it, it isn't spiders, is it? He said. It might be, said the other boy. You'll find out, won't you? Nick shook his head. No, he said. Please, no. Well, said the other boy, it's all up to you, isn't it? Change your ways or visit the cellar. The noise got louder, a scuttling sort of a scuffling noise. And while Nick Farthing had no idea what it was, he was utterly, completely certain that whatever it would turn out to be would be the most scary, terrible thing he had ever, would ever encounter. He woke up screaming. Bod heard the scream, a shout of terror, and felt the satisfaction of a job well done. He was standing on the pavement outside Nick Farthing's house, his face damp from the thick night mist. He was exhilarated and exhausted. He had felt barely in control of the dream walk, had been all too aware that there was nothing else in the dream but Nick and himself, and that all Nick had been scared of was a noise. But Bod had been, was satisfied. The other boy would hesitate before t- tormenting smaller kids. And now? Bod put his hands in, in his pockets and began to walk, not certain where he was going. He would leave the school, he thought, just as he had left the graveyard. He would go somewhere no one knew him, and he would sit in a library all day and read books and listen to people breathing. He wondered if there were still deserted islands in the world, like the one in which Robinson Crusoe had been shipwrecked. He would go and live on one of those. Bod did not look up. If he had, he would have seen a pair of watery blue eyes watching him intently from a bedroom window. He stepped into an alley, feeling more comfortable out of the light. "'Are you running away, then?' said a girl's voice. Bod said nothing. "'That's the difference between the living and the dead, and it,' said the voice. It was Liza Hempstock talking, Bod knew, although the witch girl was nowhere to be seen. "'The dead don't disappoint you. They've had their life, done what they've done. We don't change. The living, they always disappoint you, don't they?' You meet a boy who's all brave and noble, and he grows up to run away. That's not fair, said Bod. The nobody Owens I knew wouldn't have run off from the graveyard without saying so much as a fare thee well to those who cared for him. You'll break Mistress Owens' heart. Bod had not thought of that. He said, I had a fight with Silas. So? He wants me to come back to the graveyard to stop school. He thinks it's too dangerous. Why, between your talents and my bespellment, they'll barely notice you. I was getting involved. There were these kids bullying other kids. I wanted them to stop. I drew attention to myself. Liza could be seen now, a misty shape in the alleyway, keeping pace with Bod. He's out there somewhere, and he wants you dead, she said. Him has killed your family. Us in the graveyard, we want you to stay alive. We want you to surprise us and disappoint us and impress us and amaze us. Come home, Bod. Uh, I think I said things to Silas. He'll be angry. If he didn't care about you, you couldn't upset him, was all she said. The fallen autumn leaves were slick beneath Bod's feet, and the mists blurred the edges of the world. Nothing was as clean-cut as he had thought, thought it a few minutes before. I did a dream walk, he said. How did it go? Good, he said. Well, all right. You should tell Mr. Pennyworth. He'll be pleased. You're right, he said. I should. He reached the end of the alley, and instead of turning right as he had planned and off into the world, he turned left onto the high street, the road that would take him back to Dunstan Road and the graveyard on the hill. What? said Liza Hempstock. What you doing? Going home, said Bod. Like you said, there were shop lights now. Bod could smell the hot grease from the chip shop on the corner. The paving stones glistened. That's good, said Liza Hempstock, now only a voice once more. Then the voice said, Run or fade. Something's wrong.